there again, YouTube. It is once again I, your gothic host with the most Nox Burzum, back to bring you more blasphemous banter. My wife is not present tonight. She had to go to bed early tonight, and I wasn't able to get home until kind of late. She did watch the movie with me, and she has a few messages for y'all after I get done with the whole schlep, by the whole spiel here. Anyway, day 12 of 40 days of night! House on Haunted Hill from 1999. Rated R. It's an hour and 33 minutes, so it's not that uh, long of a sit. Written by Rob White and Dick Beeb. No, I'm not making up that fucking name. I swear to God, that's what the guy's legal name is. Or at least that's how it appears in his filmography. So, you know, Dick Beeb. Directed by William Malone. Starring Jeffrey Rush as the indomitable Stephen Price. Love him in this fucking role. It's absolutely mint. Famke Jansen as Evelyn Price. Tay Diggs as Eddie. And the uh, rather famous uh, comedian Chris Kattan as Pritchett in a very non-comedic role, which was a little weird to see him in, but it, it works pretty well. Plotline. Stephen Price is a successful theme park mogul with a marriage on the rocks and a desire to amuse him Self through scaring others. I mean, who doesn't like to do that, right? <laughs> Evelyn's birthday is coming up, and he decides to set up a party for her on his terms, of course. All that she requires is that it will be on haunt at the house on Haunted Hill. She has some sort of an idea in the beginning. We never end up finding what that idea is, of course, because of the plot line in the film. Uh, someone or, or something changes the entire guest list before Stephen can email it to his assistant, and our group of uh, meat sacks is brought together at a defunct sanitarium with a terrifying past. Pritchett, played by Chris Kattan, soon explains to them that his family owns the property and that he only gets paid uh, for their use of the building after the night's end. Price explains that everyone is essentially playing the game of stay alive, and if they make it through the night, they'll each take home a cool one million dollars. I mean, fuck me. I could stay almost anywhere for a million dollars. <laughs> Even in church overnight. <laughs> At any rate. The catch? The sanitarium is in fact fucking haunted. And as shit... And, uh... The sanitarium is as haunted as shit. And everything uh, laying at rest on the grounds wants you dead as fuck. A famous haunted house romp with a thrilling ending. Uh, I got notes for you about the end, but first let's get through that parental guide. On our list of content rating, sex and nudity, mild, amazing for a movie like this, I know. Violence and gore, severe, and it is earned several times throughout the movie. Profanity, severe, which is earned several times throughout the movie. Alcohol, drugs, and smoking, mild, almost non-existent. Price smokes a cigar. If you got an issue with that, well, then I don't know why you're watching a movie like this. And frightening and intense scenes. Motherfucker, of course they severe. It's a horror film, as it should be. So, uh, my notes on the film to begin with, and then we'll get to my wife's. Actually, no, we'll do my wife's first. Uh, she wanted me to make mention of the fact that uh, in the beginning, if you pay attention, you'll notice that the cameraman who is filming the whole scene in the beginning for TV, is in fact James Marster, who you may all know as Spike from Buffy fame. Uh, in fact, basically, if it hadn't been for Buffy and Angel, no one would know who the fuck the guy is. But he's there for about five minutes in the beginning of the movie. It's kind of fun. Uh, my wife, her favorite character, she said, was in fact Stephen Price. Uh, she explained that her favorite character used to be what's her face here uh, of course i didn't list her <coughs> uh she's yet she's the other person she's one of the two people who survives till the end of the film uh her name is uh sarah played by alia larder and she used to be Val's favorite, but now her favorite is actually Stephen Price. And she explained to me that it's because he actually has the widest character arc in the movie. He is a complicated uh, character with multiple different uh, reasons for things that he does. And he's a trickster, and he likes to play kind of rough. You know, he'll scare you, he'll piss you off, but, if, but he won't kill you. Uh, 
In fact, as she points out, he never hurts anybody throughout the entire film. Uh, we'll get to, you know, he, he definitely gets hurt by someone, but, you know, he doesn't cause damage to anybody else. Um, let's see here. She personally gives the movie an 8. I'm not entirely sure I'd give it an 8, but I've been watching it for 20 some odd, almost 20 some odd years, so I guess I must really like it. Uh, let's see here. The movie is very well paced, I feel. Uh, I think that the way that it is edited together is really well done. I like the couple of jump scares that there are in the film. I don't think that they're unearned or cheap. Um, I really enjoy how the kills are filmed in this movie, and they don't happen at a very fast pace, so it's really easy, so you really get to, like, soak up each of the death scenes a lot in this film. It's kind of one of the things that you're meant to do is really absorb the death scenes. And I like that about this movie. Um, I like that the ghosts are basically in, in control from the very beginning. Uh, that they are essentially who rewrites the guest list. Um, I, I, I do get disappointed in the film that we never find out what on earth uh, Evelyn's original reasoning was for having Stephen host the party at House on Haunted Hill, which is what everyone calls it. Is uh, it's 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 weird. Like they don't call it, you know, such and such sanitarium. They don't call it such and such place. They still call, they call it House on Haunted Hill. It's really strange. Um, but I, I, I dig the aesthetic. I, I do. Um, what else about it? Uh, well, if you want a quick walkthrough, essentially, Price gets uh, interviewed about a new uh, illusionary attraction at his park, which goes over quite well. Leads us into the talk between him and Evelyn, which is very tense because they're having marital problems. She's cheating on him. She thinks he doesn't know. He, of course, does know. Uh, she, he tells her that he would rather that he liked them to have something quiet and not very ostentatious for her birthday that he'd really like it to be just the two of them doing something she of course says that she wants something kind of grandiose at House on Haunted Hill and he gets annoyed by it but says fine you know send me your list whatever and she sends him the list and of course he shreds it and he types up a new list who I'm sure are people who she really dislikes and then the ghost comes in and basically the the essence of the house travels through the internet is what we're kind of given the impression of. And it manipulates the um, list. And, you know, fast forward to everyone arriving at the mansion. Well, it's not really a mansion, it's a sanitarium. And having it explained to him by Chris Catan that the road is out and they're going to have to cliff from there. And uh, confirmation that they do all, in fact, get a million bucks if they make it through the night. Uh, it's kind of amusing in the very beginning. Uh, Ellie actually asks, um, what's his name? Pritchett outright. So is this place really haunting? He's like, hey, yes, it's pretty spooky. So, like, they never don't pretend that this place is haunted. Like, it's kind of interesting because instead of you having to guess whether or not that it's going to be like a haunted mansion type idea. They say it outright from the, from the get go that there are ghosts here. It's going to get weird. And like the, the first uh, jump scare is um, after Evelyn walks into the foyer and the in this huge stained glass mural that's in the ceiling in the foyer shatters and slams down. And Evelyn is almost killed. But brushes it off really easily when she hears Stephen's voice and she just assumes that it was a prank. And he's like, oh no, my dear, I think you've been marked as the first to die. You know, that's how this shit works. This isn't Pritchett and, you know, he makes himself look all impressive and shit. And pretty soon we find out that what's really going on 
is that uh, he has one of is that Pritchett has or not Pritchett but uh, Stephen has basically one of his minions from his uh, theme park in a security in a secure room in the asylum, and what's going on is dude basically has a bunch of cameras set up to record everything that's going on and so that they have eyes in the sky everywhere and he's got basically a control pad in front of him which is going to let him like basically screw around with the house uh like we it, it is not explained and which is sort of a plot hole i will admit but essentially he has access to all the controls in the building so he can basically lock doors, he can unlock doors, he can turn on lights, he can shut off lights, he can shut off power, he can restore power. Uh, he, he can play with people in a variety of ways, you know, if, if there's for whatever reason a power closing or opening mechanism on a door, he, can, he could, you know, simulate it opening or closing on its own. The idea is really neat, and if that is, was the direction that the movie went in, it would be totally legit and probably still be pretty spooky because it's a very, very spooky environment uh, on the inside of the asylum. Um, the asylum itself is just dripping in aesthetic gothic uh, ambiance. It's this really kind of very run-down, almost rustic-looking environment on the inside. There's almost no CG used on the inside of the house itself. It's almost all practical. Um, and, like, aging effects through the use of paints. Uh, there's one... Le like, I, I watched a making of this thing a number of years ago, and there's a whole lot of really kind of cool uh, background on how the inside of the place was made. But essentially, um, they all start wandering through... And it doesn't take a super long time for the lady who's, for Sarah, I believe is her name, who's carrying the um, camera and she uh, is going to try to use this to restart her career on TV. She gets sucked into the house by something, which we never really get to see what sucked her up, but it takes her through the fucking uh, ceiling, which is a neat effect because they, because uh, the camcorder that she's holding actually gets pulled up into the air and then pulled across the ceiling. And then when she gets sucked into the wall itself, we see the image as the cram is falling and we see a huge blood stain on the ceiling. So it's pretty neat. Um, from there on out, basically, you know, Pritchard explains that, you know, the house's ghosts are playing with people. And at one point in time, uh, Ellie or Al Allie, uh, gets tricked by one of the ghosts into following who, you know, uh, Eddie, or who she thinks is Eddie, into this room where there's, like, this huge vat full of blood for no fucking reason. There's this huge vat of blood in one of the rooms, and a ghost basically lures her up there and makes her think that Eddie is in this vat of blood, and she sticks her fucking self almost all the way up to her shoulder in before, she re before Eddie appears at the door, and he's like... What are you doing? And she realizes that, like, it's not Eddie who she's searching for. And she, you know, of course, gets almost totally pulled in by the ghost, which is just weird and creepy. Um, soon thereafter, you know, uh, it's revealed in a confrontation between Price and Evelyn that there never were any real bullets in the guns, uh, that it was, you know, fakes. Well, that's what Price says, at least. And then Evelyn shoots him, or tries to shoot him with the gun, you know, and you know, like right, right next to his head, and the bottles behind him in the bar exploding. He's like, huh, well, I certainly didn't give you those, which is kind of an interesting uh, part to just... I think it shows that Evelyn thought so far ahead with her planning for this evening that she brought her own bullets, and obviously changed the ones out of her gun because he swears up and down that all he gave her were blanks. In fact, he he intimates this. He makes it sound as though everyone has blanks, even though, well, 
everyone's supposed to have legs, and it, it comes in later in the movie. Um, in fact, not too terribly later after that. Uh, the long short of it is that uh, Evelyn wanders off and says that she's going to go lay down for the night. Uh, she ends up being found in the electroconvulsive therapy room or the electroshock therapy room, and she's she's flopping all over the place like a fucking fish, and they and she's starting to smoke before they get the power turned off. They get it turned off, and Press gets all fucking sad over her, and uh, he basically gets taken to a sep sensory deprivation chamber. Uh, to get locked up because people no longer trust him because they think that he had something to do with Evelyn's death. And there's, you know, four of them, there's one of him, so he gets thrown in there. Uh, and then Blackwood, I think is his name, or Briarwood, fuck, I can just pull up here. Um, the character's name is... Blackburn, played by Peter Gallagher, uh, eventually goes back to the room that Evelyn's body is in, and this is one of the two or three glaring plot holes in the movie. He takes this small syringe out of nowhere and basically brings her back to life in a, mo in a few moments' time. And she says that, yeah, that amitriptyline uh, really worked. And I'm like, uh... You literally were flopping around like a goddamned electrocuted fish out of water. Like, you were smoking. There was blood coming out of your mouth. Like, you didn't fake that. It, it's so stupid and silly because it's like, okay, well, her heart is stopped. She's smoking. And she's very obviously really been shocked, which I don't really understand why she did that to herself if she was going for a revival. But like I said, it's a horror film and it's a plot hole, so whatever. Uh, she gets brought back. They explain, of course, that the whole plot from their point of view is that they're going to frame someone else for murdering uh, Stephen. And that more of the guns have actual bullets in them is what is basically inferred by that. Now, the guns were placed in a separate room at the beginning of the movie by Steven, and everyone gets one. The whole idea, I think, is that they're supposed to uh, keep themselves safe from the ghosts. Like I said, uh, Steven has thought ahead and has the whole place rigged. I think what his idea is in the beginning is that he's going to give all these people guns full of blanks. And I think that what the idea is going to is, is supposed to be is that if he doesn't tell them that they're blanks, they think they're really shooting at things and they get to have an exciting evening, you know, battling ghosts, essentially, that he's making it through his... Uh, illusions that he's learned to do and that he's designed, you know, through the theme parks, well, he's basically rigged the asylum to be a bunch of tricks. I think that's what was the original idea, and I think what e Evie is essentially intimating is that she basically figured out his plan and decided to replace all the blanks with actual bullets, which I think is part of why she shoots at him in the bar, is to try to clue him in that she has changed all the bullets and all the guns. Even though she gets there after him, which doesn't make much sense. Again, plot holes, but I digress. Uh... From there on out, let's see, we're, we're about three quarters of the way through. Uh, that's when all the really kind of neat things end up starting to happen. Uh, Price is thrown, is still in the sensory deprivation tank, and basically he goes a little nutty and has this weird induced vision 
of being uh, in the asylum surgeon majors uh, surgical room, I guess. And I can't even do justice to all the imagery that you are that's thrown at you in like a minute and a half. It's it's just really cool. Uh, you should definitely check that part out. Uh, afterwards, essentially, he appears in front of you know the three remaining survivors at that point, and he's covered in blood because you know fucking Evelyn sawed off fucking uh, Blackburn's head which I don't believe she was strong enough to do and got his blood all over Price and now you know uh, Allie I think is her name thinks that Price killed Blackburn I guess and she shoots the shit out of him and she and Tay Diggs and Chris Catan run off. And Evelyn ends up coming out of wherever the hell she's hiding. Which I'm not sure how on, the, how on earth she's always just out of your chop, but good for her. Walks up to Steven and completely confesses everything to him. think Because she thinks he's dead. And he like snaps out of it all of a sudden. And grabs her by the face, you know, and tosses her way in. Explains, you know, I, you know, I wish that you, you know, just be able to tell me, you know, ten years ago that, you know, you didn't love me and that you didn't want to be with me. You know, I wanted to be with you. I gave you everything, because he's actually a decent guy. Uh, like throughout this whole movie, he's just mischievous, but he's not a bad person. And she's like, well, but how did you survive? And he's, he's like, really, Evelyn, I'm Stephen Goddamn Price. And he rips his shirt open super dramatically, and of course, he's been wearing a bulletproof vest. With, with blood squigs in it the entire night. So, like, he knew to be prepared. Uh, not long, uh, he he tosses her again uh, against another wall, and she breaks through the wall and ends up falling into what they find out is the actual body pit that the surgeon was throwing all of the uh, inmates in this hospital into. Uh, see... The whole backstory on this hospital is that the sanitarium was home to a lot of abuse back in the day. Like, that's basically why it eventually got shut down, was because a fire got started during a riot that was started by the inmates because they were tired of being experimented upon by this insane psychiatrist who was also, I guess, a surgeon. And um, they find the body pit, and this darkness rises up out of it, and it engulfs Evelyn really quickly, and it kills her, and it comes after Price, and um, almost gets him right off the bat, and fucking Allie and Tay Diggs and Chris Catan are in the attic trying to get the armored window uh, covers to open, which of course they can, uh, and so they fuck off for just, like, a moment, and Price gets up there and is able to get the machine started that, like, actually lifts all of the covers for the doors and windows up anyway. And uh, gets everything unlocked, and that's when the darkness comes up the stairs and scares the crap out of. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, I got things a little out of order. I'm tired, forgive me. Uh, chases Allie and Chris Catan and T Diggs up the stairs, and you know, you see all these faces in it, and we'll get to that in just a moment uh, what that thing really is, and essentially. Chris Catan gets taken by the darkness. The two remaining survivors run up the stairs, and Stephen Price uh, sees that the you know the door is open just enough for people to get out, and that the darkness is about to take both of the remaining characters. So he pushes Allie out of the way and saves her life. 
uh, right as it just completely engulfs him and uh, it tries to take Tate Higgs and you know the the swirling miasma of, t of evil is like you know no one gets out of this alive now everyone who's uh, responsible will be held the cow is like I'm not even part of this I was adopted and ditches out the window and that's just in time for light to come streaming in the window and drive back the darkness and they end up finding out that they are the last ones left holding all the cashier's checks for a million bucks a piece but now they're trapped so that's the end of house on haunted hill i personally give it between a seven and an eight um i've always gotten a kick out of this film i think it's a little it's more than a little cheesy I'm willing to give it a seven and a half. Um, it's a little bit of a cheesy film. Um, there are those, these just glaring plot holes in it of like a how Famke managed to not die, being completely fucking electrocuted like that. Uh, you know, when did she s switch out all the bullets in the guns? Because you know, Price gets because Price gets shot by one of the other uh, people's guns by Ali's gun and that shouldn't be able, not only should that not be able to happen but Price has stated that he gave people blanks and he says this when you know when Evelyn is pointing the gun her gun at him earlier in the film so I don't know. I've always been very confused about that part, and that I think that that's a major plot hole in the narrative because obviously he wouldn't say that just to met to like confuse people, like either that or he didn't think that she would shoot him. And I think it's a lot more likely that she thought ahead and brought bullets for her own guns because she's the one who designed everything. And came up with the whole concept. Like, it's not a cocktail party. That's not what she's doing there. Like, it was going to be an activity, I think. So, I don't know. I don't know. I get super confused there. Um, overall, I think it's a good film. I wanted to mention the miasma. So, it was one of the coolest parts of the film. And what it is, is a solid my, miasmatic mass of this swirling cloud of spirits. So this was back in 1999, so they didn't quite have the CG capabilities to create just an amorphous mass like they do now for things like in, say, Harry Potter, or not Harry Potter, but in um, Crimes of Grindelwald, you know, with the, um, or Phantom Tales of Beasts and Where Find Them, rather, where they have, you know, the one character whose power form is essentially this swirling black mass. That, I think, is what they were going for in House on Haunted Hill. What they got is this kind of neat effect instead where it's a single panel of all these images of like naked women's bodies mixed together with like tentacles mixed together with smoke and there's a couple of other layers but I can't remember exactly what's in there. It's, it's all in this behind the scenes I saw at one point and uh, they just mirror image it and it's really kind of neat looking because it's meant to look like it's solid enough to like move around corners or walls and like grab a hold of things so it's neat um i think that there were some sort of wasted opportunities to bring to life the props in the sanitarium that's one of the reasons why i don't quite give it an eight because like there's a lot of just standstill props they're meant just, you know, for horror movie purposes in the film. And, yeah, I get that it would have been really 
cheap and kind of chintzy if everything was CG'd or if everything was a puppet. But at the same time, like, there's this really neat body that's been preserved, for instance, with the whole injecting wax into the, the veins method. Um, if you've ever heard of uh, the visible body um, exhibit that goes around uh, the nation every couple of years, one of those is in the basement. And I was always very disappointed that that didn't move around. And I don't know, I guess I just thought, thought it with it being an actual haunted house that the ghosts would do a little bit more with the actual like items inside the building. But that's just me. Um, it is still a good movie. It is still really well acted. It's still fun. And if you like late 90s cheesy horror flicks, I think that you'll definitely have fun with it. Rent it this Halloween. I don't really know where you can get it from. I've had my copy of the DVD since 2005. So, good luck. Google search it. Peace, love, and heavy fucking melt, folks. Bye.